Some of you, when you see a great man of God, you excuse yourself. You put them in a different pedestal. And you do that in the name of honor. But you also disobey God. Because everything that God does in others is to trigger a possibility in your life. He says, imitate those who through faith and patience. Hallelujah. This is how we improve in the kingdom. You must constantly have something before your face. Something to grow into. New shoes to grow into. So when I read a testimony, it must stir possibility in my life that God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to walk in your name. And what your name can produce will be seen in my life. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. It says, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Everybody read Colossians chapter 3 verse 17 together. One, two, go. This is an instruction to the believer. He says, whatsoever you do, do in the name of Jesus. So my question to you tonight is, have you been using the name? Have you been doing things in the name of Jesus? Because listen, the name of Jesus has been given to you. But you may choose not to use it. For whatever reason, it is possible for you to go on with your own wisdom. In your own power and might and intelligence and so he gives you this firm instruction whatever you do do in the name of Jesus meaning it's a consciousness you can imbibe I'm not going to do ministry in my own strength I'm not going to do marriage in my own strength I'm not going to do business in my own strength the Word of God says whatever you do do in the name of Jesus so I'm going to do this conscious of the power of the name of Jesus at my disposal. Come on, are you with me? It's a consciousness. It's something to imbibe. It's something to rehearse. I'm going to do in the name of Jesus. As I'm walking out today, as I'm moving, leaving the house today, I'm walking in the consciousness of my identity in the Lord. You know, a lot of people have tried to teach on the name of Jesus. And they've used well-meaning explanations that do a good job, a decent job explaining it. People have called it the power of attorney. And lawyers here know what the power of attorney is. It is the right to function in someone else's name. Yeah, it's close enough. But that's not quite what the name of Jesus is. The name of Jesus is not the power of attorney. It's not. It's not a privilege to use someone else's name as powerful as that is. It's not a privilege to function in someone else's authority as powerful as that is. Listen, Jesus did not just die for you. He died as you. This is the consciousness of Christian identification. He died as you. He took your place. He died your death. He was buried as though you were buried. He was raised as though you were raised. And so the Bible says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And has raised us up. So in the eye of an observer, only one person died. In the eye of an observer, only one person was buried. But now the eyes of Revelation says, God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us. He says we died together with him. He has quickened us together with him. He has raised us up. This is the communication you have when you have the consciousness of the name. This is the real ideology. In the eyes of God and in the realm of the spirits, it was as though I was the one who was raised from the dead. 
No wonder he gave the authority to the church. It has been bequeathed to the church. He said, all power in heaven and earth have been given unto me. Go therefore. There is a biblical terminology that explains this. And I try to teach this almost every reboot camp. It is the doctrine of baptism. What is baptism? Baptism is a spiritual operation that describes how we become beneficiaries of the redemptive work of Christ. It's a spiritual operation that describes how we became beneficiaries of the redemptive work of Christ. Let me explain it to you this way. How is it logically that someone's death is your death? The answer is by baptism. How is it that someone's burial is your burial? The answer is by baptism. How is it that someone's resurrection is your resurrection? The answer is by baptism. Put up Colossians chapter 2 verse 12. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12. It says, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the operation of God. Another translation says, faith in the walking of God. Meaning, I have faith in the working of God. He said the death of Jesus is my death. So I say that the death of Jesus is my death. And I say the burial of Jesus was my burial. And I say the resurre resurrection of Jesus is my resurrection. And so I function in the name of Jesus as my new identity. Did you hear what I said? Come on, it doesn't look like you're in church today. I said, I function in the name of Jesus as my new identity. I take it again for someone who is slow at the back. He says, I function in the name of Jesus as my new identity. It's a consciousness. Because you see, you need to know who Jesus is. Even in the incarnation, you need to know who Jesus was. He wasn't just a great prophet. You see, if Jesus was a great prophet, you just look at the miracles and marvel. When you watch a superhero movie, you might be impressed by it, but you know you can never be it. You can try to pretend. Thank you. You can try to pretend that it's you. You can put a cloth on your back pretending it's a cape, but you never really flew. Are you getting what I'm saying? So, but it is life-changing to understand that Jesus was not just a great prophet. Jesus was the second Adam. Oh, God. Are you in church? Yes, Your life would change when you begin to see Jesus not just as the Son of God, not just as a great man that walked the face of the earth. When you begin to see Jesus as the second Adam, God's covenant man, so that everything he did will become possible for you. Did you hear what I just said? Jesus was God's covenant man so that everything he did will become possible for you. And that's why when you look at the ministry of Jesus, you discover something very interesting. Almost every time he was given credit for something, he was quick to say you can do it too because that's what he came to show. That's what he came to show. So listen, He's walking with the disciples. He sees a fig tree. He curses the fig tree. And the next time they are passing that route, they run to him saying, the fig tree you cursed is dried from his roots. And immediately he says, if you say to this mountain. So, like, what kind of leader is this? So selfless. Oh, you are impressed I spoke to a tree and it dried up. You can do more. If you say to a mountain, 
be removed. Be cast into the sea. You don't doubt in your heart. You shall have what you say. So he's not putting himself at the pedestal that people cannot, you know, try to reach. He immediately, listen, not the next day, he immediately said, you, you can do it too. You can do greater. And he thought like that and spoke like that because that was his ministry. He's the second Adam. He's here to show you what is possible. Another example I gave recently. Jesus is walking on water. And I put it this way. And this is it's very important to understand it this way. The record for a man walking on water lasted only a few moments. You know, that's very instructive for us. Because all of us like exclusivity. If we're being honest. Some of you, even clothes. You see someone wearing your type of clothes, you're uncomfortable. Maybe even color. Uh, that one is painful, Sha. <laughs> Not exactly. I'm just playing. <laughs> Hallelujah. But Jesus, he's walking on water. Peter sees him. And he says, if it is you, ask me to come. I don't know where Peter got that idea. And Jesus says, come. And Peter tries it. It actually works for a while. I don't care that he tried to sink. He tried. Some of you all need to try some more. Are, are you with me? Yes. Exercise your faith. And so, in that walking of water scenario, we understand supernatural mentorship and what it means to see Jesus as our second Adam. Whatever you see him do, do. Just the same way on earth, he said, whatever I see the Father do is what I do. The same way, whatever you see Jesus do, do it. Come on, are you with me? Yes, because he's God's covenant man for your sake. When Jesus was on the earth, he called God Father, and that was very strange. Almost got him killed. In fact, him calling God Father was one of the reasons he was killed. Reasons he was killed. What? How dare you? Because you see, the Jews saw God as someone so transcendent. He is so far removed from humanity. He's so high up there. And you know, this Jesus, every two sentences, my father this, my father that, my father this, my father that. Who, who do you think you are? And he didn't keep that exclusive either. He said, in my father's house, there is room for more children. Many of you thought he was talking about buildings. No, he was talking about the family. In my father's house, there are more dwelling places. He says, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, he said, where I am right now, not... Come on, are you with me? If that text meant what many people thought it meant, he would have said, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I will be, you will be also. That's not what he said. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am. So he's saying, I am going to make sonship possible for all of you. That's what he was saying. So that where I am, you will be also. For some of you who don't really understand this, you're just hearing this for the first time. First and foremost, a basic rule of hermeneutics, the science of Bible interpretation is this. When the plain sense makes sense, seek no other sense. But you know that the text is figurative when it does not make practical sense, you know, when you read it literally. In my father's house, there are many mansions. How can you have mansions in the house? He must have been speaking figuratively. In my father's oikia, in my father's family, there are many dwelling places. In fact, newer translations get it. A lot of newer translations actually say, in my father's family, there are many dwelling places. 
and he says, I'm going to make room for more sons. And the writer of Hebrews says, he brought many sons to glory. He did what he said. Some of you thought Jesus went up to heaven to start building, you know, putting in my father's house. There are many mansions there, you know. So he's putting brick upon brick. But, but the Bible says Jesus is seated. <laughs> At the right hand of God. He is not doing any work. He's not building a house for you. And he does not need to. The house you so desperately need has already been built. And the place he went to prepare was you. That's why he says, I will come to you. And he began to talk about the Holy Spirit. You were the place he prepared. But just think about it. Think about it. Even sonship was no longer exclusive. That's life changing. And then the humility of Jesus. You know, when he was raised from the dead, he said, go and tell my brethren. that I go to my father and your father. My God and your God. This is Christian identification. He's not ashamed to call us brothers. Go and tell my brethren, he said. Well, what kind of leader is this that is not trying to subjugate and put you under I mean, he, Jesus called you brother. Listen, by the way, this is an opportunity to tell every pastor, every man of God. Yes, in a sense, you are a spiritual father because you are a trainer. But never forget, we have common salvation and common faith. And at the end of the day, we all have one father. I mean, if Jesus can call us brother, uh, don't tie this thing to your chest too much. Come on, are you listening to me? Listen, the Bible teaches honor. The Bible, you know, and a lot of people try to even talk and castigate against people calling someone spiritual father. You, there, you can't, you can't say complicate around that. It's a biblical teaching. Someone said Paul, you know, called himself father because he was old physically also. No, R read history well. Paul the apostle died in his 50s. He was not old. So when he called Timothy son, it was by the Spirit. It was discipleship. Do you understand what I'm saying? But at the same time, I mean, Jesus calls us brothers because he's God's covenant man to bring us into a new possibility. He has brought us into a new possibility. Say that from your spirit. Say, he has brought me into a new possibility. Say, what I see him do, I do. And even greater. Say it again. What I see him do, I do. And greater. I, know, I want to read a text that also beams some light on Christian identification. The Bible tells us that in Matthew chapter 16, in Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13, Jesus asked, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And well, they had a lot of responses because people are talkers and people always assume instead of asking. So he says, oh, some say you are John the Baptist. I can't begin to tell you how silly that is. Because John the Baptist was Jesus' cousin. They lived in the same generation. So what kind of revelation is that? But anyway. Some say you are Elias. Some say you are this. Some say that you are that. And then he says, but who do you say that I, the son of man, am? And Peter, by the Spirit, says you are the Christ. The son of the living God. 
And then Jesus says, I say to you, you are Peter. Oh my God. And this is Christian identification. That the revelation of Christ is our new identity. When we discover who Christ is, we discover, we rediscover who we are. Come on, are you getting this? When we discover who Christ is, we rediscover who we are. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, I say you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church. The moment you discover who Christ is, you discover who you are. That's my personal testimony. It feels like I began to live when I discovered Jesus. It feels like I began to live when I got filled with the Holy Spirit. It's, it's hard to remember anything significant in my life before then. Because this is my new identity. Come on, are you with me? Think about it. So every Thing that Jesus did he did so that you would do do you believe that if I was supposed to title this sermon I would call it contagious power contagious power a power that can spread a power that is replicable can walk in his shoes. Oh, by privilege I can. Yeah. Yeah. Because the shoes are mine anyway. By grace. The shoes are mine. I mean, what kind of leader will be selfless enough to say, the works that I do, you will do also and greater. Because that was his ministry. He did all of that as a pattern. He did all of that as the second Adam. Everything he did was an invitation for you to do. Let me tell you this. This simple truth I just shared with you is the secret of every great man of God I know. Some people, when they hear this, they are just like, hmm, that's nice. Mm. Some other people, when they hear it, they put it to work immediately. When Archbishop Ben Sinidawsa heard a teaching like this, he went to the pastor after the service. He said, what you said, did you mean it? The pastor said, yes. You mean I can do it? He said, yes. So he rode on a bike, looking for... It. Because he read that the Bible says they shall raise the dead. Started knocking from house to house. Do you have any dead person here? Do you have any? I have discovered that what separates people in the kingdom is simple faith. You know, some of you are sitting down waiting for an extra revelation. Something, you know, very eloquent that I will say that will just shake you. And you will jump and say, hey! But for some of you, just hear, hearing Jesus is my example, my covenant man, my second Adam. That's enough. You mean it, sir? Everything he did was so that I can walk in his stead, walk in his shoes. You know what Paul said? He says, you are ambassadors for Christ. He says, we beseech you in Christ's stead. What a privilege. That God was in Christ walking, you know, reconciling the world unto himself. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Meaning we carry the same assignment because it's the second Adam, our covenant man. I refuse to live an ordinary life. Come on, I said I refuse to live an ordinary life. Turn your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 6. God. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12. 
Are you there? It's like some of you are physically tired. <laughs> but give this service your best. Are you there? All right, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12. Read together loud as you can. One, two, go. Oh, my God. Read it again. One, two, go. It says that you do not become sluggish. He says, but imitate. 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 Meaning when you see someone do something that is consistent with your destiny, imitate. This is how we improve. He says, don't be sluggish. Don't be slothful in business. Instead, be followers of those who through faith and patience obtained the promise. What does it mean to be sluggish? It means to have no drive. No desire for more. Some of us are too easily satisfied. Too easily satisfied. What can the Lord produce with your life if you gave him more room? If you held more to the word of God, what can he produce? What can his name produce in your life? You see, some of you, listen, oh my God. Some, some of you, when you see a great man of God, you excuse yourself. You put them in a different pedestal. And you do that in the name of honor. But you also disobey God. Because everything that God does in others is to trigger a possibility in your life. Peter is meant to be all of us. I, I want to walk on water too. Can I join you? He says, imitate those who through faith and patience. Hallelujah. This is how we improve in the kingdom. You must constantly have something before your face. Something to grow into. New shoes to grow into. Don't get sluggish. Some of us were not like this before, but we've, we've settled. This is the word of God to you. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit. Serving the Lord. Don't be sluggish. Imitate those who through faith and patience. So when I read a testimony, it must stir possibility in my life that God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to walk in your name. And what your name can produce will be, will produce will be seen in my life. Do you believe that? Say that when we say what the name of Jesus can produce. Will be seen in my life. Listen, this is how I got here. You know, sometimes people sit in front of you and say, what's your biggest secret? And more often than not, what you tell them, they already know. Because we are looking for something dramatic. When you read about saints of old and what God made of their life, what does that do to you? What does that do to you? What if God showed you your real destiny, what you are truly capable of, unlocked potentials, sleeping giants? What will you do? When you look at Mary, who, who didn't consider herself special, always considered herself ordinary. She had a greater destiny than she acknowledged. Until an angel showed up with a salutation that didn't look like anything anybody had told her before. Hail! Highly favored of God. Me, highly favored? When I go to any place, nobody recognizes me. I just sit in one court, highly favored. I never saw myself highly favored. Sir, you need to check your address well. Are you in the right place? What name did Jesus put on it? Is it really Mary that God put on that address? You're talking to me? Yeah, yes, you. Highly favored. 
Though you thought you were ordinary, the Holy Ghost will overshadow you. And something life-changing is about to come from your womb. Come on, are you with me? Uh, listen, uh, you might have a different assignment, but the same pattern. You considered yourself ordinary? Let the Holy Ghost touch you well. <laughs> Let him take a hold of you. And then the same Mary was telling Elizabeth later, he says, now all generations shall call me blessed. All generations. Can you say that over your life? Say all generations shall call me blessed. All generations shall call me blessed. Listen, this is what the anointing of the Holy Ghost can do. All generations. Everybody always looked at me narrowly, but now all generations shall call me blessed. Nobody ever really truly gave me a chance, but now all generations shall call me blessed. Uh, do, do you believe that? All generations. Do you believe that the power of Jesus can make you an eternal excellency? A joy of many generations. Say that with me now. All generations shall call me blessed. Say by the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Now all generations shall call me blessed. When you read in the Bible, ordinary people with an extraordinary God. You look at timid Jeremiah. You look at Moses the stammerer. You look at all these people. Some of them with errors. Some of them from dysfunctional families. Some of them are all sorts of people from all walks of life. And now, time will fail us to talk about Moses and David and Elijah and Elisha. Uh, hey, listen, who through faith subdued kingdoms, stopped the mouth of lions, walked through violent fires, received the dead back to life. You must write your own faith story. Come on, did you hear what I said? You must write your own faith story. Say it again. Say, all generations shall call me blessed. You know, sometimes I read of men that God has used even in our generation. I'm just like, You, 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 you hear stories and you're like, what? What? You know, this is the best age of the church in Nigeria. In our parents' time, if you want to face Jesus, you will confront many idols. You had to be sure. <laughs> and you hear, let me tell you this. You know, as a young pastor, it is easier to start a church now. We are reaping the benefits of generals. They've broken the ground. There were villages that were forbidding that they entered. When you read of, you know, the founder of CAC, there was a place, I mean... They called an evil forest. And he just went there with his bell. <laughs> Bow down and red in Yoruba. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, ye everlasting doors. <laughs> and snakes started running away. When you, when, you, when you hear stories like that, what, what does that do? I don't know. And you, listen. It should make you uncomfortable. There is more. There is more. There is a version of you, Pastor Dami, that God wants to see. Something can emerge. Something new. Something bigger. Something greater. Something greater. Who through faith subdued kingdoms. I'm writing my faith story. I refuse to be ordinary. All generations shall call me blessed. 
Archbishop Benson in Daosa in a crusade. The crowd was overwhelming. So people were, you know, literally in places they were not supposed to be just to try and hear him. And some of them touched the live wire and they died. <clears throat> the program had already ended. He was on his way out. So they told him, so he came back, picked the mic, spoke over them. All of them came back to life. All of them. You know, so the, the program don't end. <laughs> All, you know, you, you see, we're talking about something in the presence of everybody. What is, what, 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 you know, in, in your life, there must be some fingerprints of divinity. Finger, something, something that, listen, I'm not talking about church people, something that a magician can observe and say, this is the finger of God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. A magician. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The magicians of Egypt observe, say, ah, this is the finger of God. Yes. They sack themselves. That means we are not serving the right God. This is the this one pass us. There must be there must be signs, 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 signs. And the good news is, he tells you that you can imitate. You 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 can covet it. You can walk in it. You know, just by honoring it in other people's lives, you invite it into yours. Did you hear what I said? Just, just by honoring it. And all the examples that we have, they are imperfect example. The ultimate is Jesus, looking on to Jesus. Everything he did, he says you can do. Are you ready for more in your life? I said, are you ready for more in your life? So let me simply tell you what God's plan is for this camp meeting. God wants to multiply the impact of this ministry by increasing your capacity. That's what he wants to do. That's how it becomes contagious. If the man of God, you know, performs miracles every now and then, that's nice. But if all of you, all, everyone, steps into a new possibility, and every two weeks we are hearing crazy things, I mean crazy things, I mean crazy things. Ah, uh -huh. So we are simply here to say, God, you said we should imitate. <laughs> you did it for this person. You did it for that person. You did it for this person. Do it in my life. Hallelujah. Oh, no, Mose. Mose, ba, oku, soro, oku, ba. Oh, no, Elijah. Elijah, ba, ino, soro, ino, ba. Oh, no, Maria. Maria be Olubal Araye O Wonu Mio O Tumba Misa O Wonu Maria Maria be Olubal Araye O Wonu Mio O is in you for a reason. Oh, I know Mose. Mose, bow to sorrow. Oh, I know Elijah. Elijah, by no sorrow. Oh, I know Maria. Maria, be your Hallelujah. You are in me for a reason. Make a name for yourself with my life. I'm, listen, Lord, no more mediocrity. I'm ready for more. 
I'm ready for more. I'm ready for more. Put something on me that will shake my generation. I'm ready for more. I'm ready to write my own faith story. I'm ready to write my own faith story. to write my own faith story. I'm ready to write my own faith story. Make a name for yourself with my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 